Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the stage as we begin our session. Hello, it's del we're delighted to have all of you here. I think I'll just you know, start right away. The door is closed, uh, so we have you as a captive audience. Um, because we're talking today about, a, uh, on the one hand, a very tragic topic, but on the other hand, a very lighthearted and, I think, hopeful topic. Uh, we all know that the world is in great turmoil, and there are dictators in many countries that are uh, doing you know, awful things uh, that you know, are, are, are terrible to, their, to the people themselves. And the result is that there are some 69 million people uh, who are uh, displaced worldwide. And 30 million of those uh, people are children. Many of them are probably not going to get back to uh, their homeland. Uh, and in fact, um, they will probably end up uh, growing up inside uh, refugee camps or other camps. Uh, the typical stay in a refugee camp is 17 years. The problem is that uh, there are many uh, camps that don't have great schools or don't even have schools, uh, but there is a lot of talent. I have met uh, some refugees who grew up in camps and they worked terribly hard uh, and they ended up at Harvard or Yale. So there is incredible talent in these camps as well. The MacArthur Foundation gave $100 million uh, to Sesame Workshop and the International Rescue Committee to help educate those kids. So we are going to hear much more about this. So let me uh, uh, introduce my illustrious, wonderful panel. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Cecilia Conrad to my far right, Managing Director of the 100 and Change uh, at MacArthur Foundation. We have to my near right, Sarah Smith, who runs uh, the Education uh, Department at International Rescue Com uh, Committee, or we'll call it IRC. Mm -hmm. uh, and Sherry Weston to my left, who is the president of uh, Global Impact and Philanthropy at Sesame Workshop. So uh, Sarah, let me start with you. You've been to many refugee camps. Uh, you've been in the field. You've seen things on the ground. Can you take us through your most recent trip what it was like, who you met, what were these people uh, there for? Sure, um, and thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, so actually my most recent visit was to Colombia to see Venezuelans who uh, were fleeing uh, right during the demonstrations um, into Colombia, uh, and um, but also very recently was in the Middle East. And in uh, all of the camps I've been in around the world, um, there are a few things uh, that stand out. W one is that um, most of them uh, do look similar to what you see in the newspaper. Um, they're often made up of tents, um, uh, temporary houses, and other kinds of shelters. Um, what the news sometimes doesn't show is that they're often also filled with small businesses and schools and community centers because uh, so many of them uh, do uh, last for a very long time. Um, but really what's least known is that the majority of refugees do not live in r refugee camps. Uh, they're living in uh, regular communities. So all the Syrians who have fled into Turkey and Jordan and Lebanon and Iraq 80% of them are living in towns and uh, communities outside of the refugee camps. And for them, it's uh, quite challenging. Many, I, I was in Iraq last year and um, I remember seeing very large um, buildings that were under construction uh, just for regular construction and families had taken over those buildings um, 
you know, parents with very young children who had nowhere to go. And so they had moved into these buildings that were under construction. Um, so refugees can live in, in circumstances like that. They could live in a tent in a refugee camp. Um, and as you can imagine for these children, um, many of whom have experienced just unthinkable tragedies and uh, witnessed violence or lost loved ones um, growing up and living, as you said, for their entire childhood under these circumstances uh, is extremely challenging for them. Uh, can you step back a little bit and give us some more context, uh, you know, on the refugee crisis? You know, what are some of the numbers around the world? And, you know, tell us what some of them are the result of. Sure. Well, as you noted, there are uh, 68 and a half million people displaced from their homes right now. And this is more than at any time in recorded history ever in history before. So, um, and the trend unfortunately is not going down. Um, the IRC uh, was founded by Albert Einstein in 1933 and we were founded to help refugees who were fleeing Europe um, during World War II. And uh, what we've seen over that long history um, is that uh, there have been ebbs and flows in, in refugees and displaced people. Um, but right now, we are seeing refugee numbers at an all-time high. And for children, um, there are, are more than half of, of the world's refugees are children. And um, more than half of those children have no access to any form of education. Um, it's particularly the case for very young children, who we'll talk about later. Um, the, the youngest children, <coughs> zero to five, uh, have almost no access to any form of pre-primary education or learning. Um, and for post-primary school age children, uh, it's also very unlikely that they have a chance to go to school, any sort of formal or non-formal formal learning. And most of these kids have, as I said, experienced such uh, severe or prolonged kinds of adversity. Um, we talk about many of them having uh, m perhaps experienced um, the kind of adversity that leads to toxic stress. Um, many are uh, struggling to um, succeed even if they are in school. And um, they also, uh, their parents themselves have uh, had such harsh experiences that for them to provide the support that they these kids need um, is extremely challenging too. Yeah, no, I can imagine. Cecilia, um, so, uh, you saw a lot of problems and a lot of solutions uh, exposed during the process of this grant competition, this giant competition. Um, tell us how you and the MacArthur Foundation uh, made a decision to settle on Syria and the refugee crisis. I mean, the reason I ask this is that, look, uh, you could have actually thought about creating schools, better schools in these refugee camps or, or, or camps for, for in, uh, displaced people, uh, or you could have improved the education there. Why did you choose uh, this particular one? So I think to start, I want to give some context to this for those who are not com familiar with 100 and Change. Um, it was a competition that MacArthur launched in order to identify a place where we could make a hundred million dollar investment and move the needle on a social problem, really have an impact. And we elected to do this in a really different way than philanthropy tra traditionally operates. We had a global open call. It was open to any problem solution combination. It was open to for profits, non profits, and it was for any kind of problem. So, as you've said, we were overwhelmed with not only the, the problems that we learned about, and many of which we already knew about, but also by the excitement and solutions that were out there. We had asked a panel of external judges to evaluate the projects using four criteria, meaningful, verifiable, meaning evidence-based, feasible, and durable. Was there a plan to sustain the impact of this project, of this solution, over the long term beyond the $100 million grant? Um, out of that process, we narrowed, ultimately, our board narrowed this down to four projects, and they were quite different. So it isn't even a matter of just comparing 
early childhood to other kinds of education initiatives. Um, one of the, the, the four finalists, in addition to the Sesame IRC project, one was Harvest Plus, which was focused on micronutrient deficiencies uh, and using biofortified foods to address that. One was Catholic Relief Services in collaboration with two other groups to shift the care of children from institution, institutions, that is orphanages, to more family-based care. Uh, and the third was a project that was going to adapt the technologies used to care for premature babies so that they would work in low resource settings and reduce the infant mortality in those contexts. So these are all, I think, compelling and important kinds of issues. And our board ultimately, first of all, they felt like it was a really tough choice. So they gave three extra grants out at 15 million apiece. Uh, but the other thing I think that led them to this particular project was first of all, as I said, we wanted something that was evidence-based and there's so much evidence about the effect at very early childhood of the kind of toxic stress that these children were facing and also evidence of the consequences of this disruption to the likelihood that they would be able to be ready for education later in their lives. We saw this as something that an intervention now could have really long-term positive impacts for these young children. Um, there was a certain urgency to this particular problem as the numbers already indicate that the foundation found attractive. And so we saw it as something that could, was impactful, that there was a strong evidence base, a team that came together that brought together strengths, you know, complementary skills with Sesame and its expertise in early childhood and IRC and its network of health workers and community workers who could help to deliver this content. So it was a very, it's a great package when you put it all together. Okay, well, Sherry, okay. So now I want to hear from you about how did the winning idea come about? Like where did the idea come from? Who thought of it? Well, uh, let me give you a little context, too, because I'm sure everyone knows Sesame Street, but people often don't know that we're a Sesame Workshop is a global nonprofit that creates Sesame Street here, but also around the world, and that we're not just television. We create educational content, particularly to help particularly vulnerable children address really tough issues, and we've had a long history of that. So when we are always looking in the countries in which we operate and in just in terms of what are some of the most pressing issues affecting children, this clearly was one of the biggest, um, the sheer number of children affected by displacement. So actually, before we knew a thing about MacArthur, um, we were looking at who could we partner with to make a meaningful difference in the lives of these children. And we did a very thorough um, analysis of a lot of wonderful organizations working in the refugee space, UNICEF, Mercy Corps, Save the Children, all who do great work and we continue to work with in various capacities, but we um, decided the IRC was the ideal partner. Um, for a couple of reasons. A, they focus exclusively on refugee um, crisis settings. B, they have Sarah Smith, and they have an <laughs> early education um, uh, team. And so that was critical, and that they care so much about research. And research is a key part of Sesame's DNA. Everything we do is based on formative research and impact research to make sure we're having the impact that we set out to. So we actually went to the IRC. Um, it would have been... 2016, and um, David Miliband, who runs the IRC, agreed that we would do a, a partnership. We announced it at the World Humanitarian Summit, I remember. We didn't have any funding yet. You know, none of our work is possible without funding. But we decided it was such an important issue, we would put a stake in the ground to let people know that Sesame and the IRC were coming together. And it worked. We raised about a quarter of a million dollars for a pilot. So we were already in the region taking Sesame Arabic content adapting it and working with IRC in their learning centers, in their home visitations, to see if our content would enhance their direct services for children in the Syrian response region. That's when we heard about MacArthur and Change. <laughs> and we thought, gosh, we have to apply for this. And if the, if the um, call is for any organization addressing a pressing issue of our time. This clearly is one of the most pressing issues. We asked the IRC if they would join us, and we applied, never dreaming, 
let's be honest, 18 <laughs> months later, 1,904 applicants later, <laughs> that Sesame and the IRC would win $100 million. But, you know, it, it's not just the grant itself, the, the dollars, of course. We're now creating the largest early childhood intervention in the history of humanitarian response. Um, and one of the things we realized is less than 3%, just 3%, of all humanitarian aid goes to education. And you think, how can that be? But because it was always crisis situations, humanitarian system is set up to give, to save lives. It's shelter, it's, it's food, it's security. And yet, the point you make, Cheryl, about now the, the amount of time families are displaced, if we're not investing in education, these are lost generations. And because we know that the first five years of life is when we can have the greatest return on investment, and to Sarah's point, because we know when children are experienced this kind of chronic stress, toxic stress, it literally debilitates their ability to learn. It, it affects their brain development. So if we can reach them in those critical early years, then they have a much better chance of being on a path to be able to not only be able to learn, but to thrive. And without that, how are they expected to rebuild their societies? So that's what led to this work. And, and, and we're also so grateful, because I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say one other thing, that in success, and I think I can speak for, yeah. for Cecilia, that it was meant to shine a light on the incredible need to be addressing early education in these settings and the incredible potential if we do, and to be a catalyst for others to invest. Okay, no. Well, Cecilia, I want to go back to you. Um, now that they have already won, can you share some of the concerns that you had about the proposal um, before you were you know, selecting the winner? Because obviously there are pros and cons to each proposal, right? <laughs> uh, certainly, I'm willing to do that. <laughs> the. Uh, First of all, I just want to pick up on what Sherry was saying because part of the attraction was the idea that this might be something that would expand the efforts to do early childhood work in a humanitarian setting. And we've already seen some real evidence of yes. that, which I'll, I'll let you talk about later. Um, what were the concerns? Well, the first concern, I think, obviously, for most of us, we'll think about the fact that it's a very volatile region. And um, we... You, you have to worry, could there be something that, that will happen that might interrupt the ability to deliver, the, deliver these kinds of services. Here is where it was important that there was a partnership of Sesame, but also IRC, who's had more experience in working in this kind of context. But that was certainly a concern. Um, I, I think another concern will be sort of a funny one, because many times when we have our finance team evaluate the projects for 100 and change. Every project that involved a collaboration, they put a red flag. And they said, oh, collaboration's inherently risky. But the fact is that to do the kind of work that we wanted our grant to make possible, to take $100 million and really deploy it in, in a, a fairly limited period of time, it's a five-year grant, Typically, would it require collaborations among, among organizations? And so all of our top organizations were collaborations. So yes, it's a red flag, but it wasn't something that was immediately going to stop us. <laughs> so Sarah, how do you, as IRC on the ground, uh, you know, guard against this volatility and guard against some of, you know, the mishaps that can happen? How are you going to protect Elmo? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and Elmo is... Um, very much uh, a worthy cause to protect these these circumstances and countries are um, extremely challenging to work in. But um, this is what IRC does. We um, are a very large organization that works in forty conflict affected countries around the world. Really, the hardest places in the world. This is where we operate. Um, we have. 26,000 employees and only a few hundred of those are international staff. So the vast majority of our staff are people from the countries where we work. And that is really the crucial part of this. Um, we have a network of 
amazing individuals. I mean, these are really truly the heroes of the IRC um, who are working day in, day out to implement these programs. And um, they are part of these communities. So for them, this is about building their communities or rebuilding them, um, teaching their own children, and uh, and they ultimately are the wo ones who um, make sure that the programs are able to run despite all the volatility. Can you tell us one instance of a time when something terrible happened and what IRC did to sort of deflect that? Sure. Um, well, actually, I'll speak about an incident that happened during the application process. Um, Sherry, I don't know if you remember this. Um, in the there, there are no refugee camps in Lebanon, but there are what are known as informal tented settlements. And these settlements are essentially communities alongside other communities. And they're right. made up of um, uh, typically um, plastic sheeting tents. And um, it gets cold in the winter in Lebanon, and the inside of these tents, families have um, stoves, and they use those stoves for primarily to stay warm. Um, and right before uh, we were about to finalize our application, um, there was a large fire in one of these um, settlements. Now, this isn't due to conflict, but it is very much a result of uh, people who have been displaced living in circumstances um, that are really not right for people to be living in. Um, and so there was a fire in uh, this settlement. Uh, it was um, extremely devastating, and um, young children were killed. Uh, the IRC immediately, we, we launch emergency responses. That's what we do. Um, so we responded. We're not um, typically responding to fires, but we um, helped these families rebuild their homes. Um, we provided counseling services for the parents. Uh, the preschool that we run nearby um, had several children uh, who were in the fire who had been going to that preschool. So we provided uh, counseling for the teachers as well, and also then worked with the teachers to help uh, educate the family members about how to stay safe in the home. Um, so dealing with kind these kinds of crises is really in our DNA, and it's what we do day in, day out. Right. Now, you mentioned that a lot of people are not in refugee camps, official mm -hmm. camps, but just in these communities as you talk about. Um, the camps themselves have guards, right? They have, um, I don't know, is it the UN that actually, you know, hires the, uh, you know, uh, the soldiers, brings soldiers in to protect the camps, but those communities don't have anyone, right? Right. Usually it's a combination of government officials and United Nations officials who monitor camps. And depending on the country, some are very guarded. Some have large walls and uh, exactly the, the kinds of um, wire around them that keep people in and out, and they're very uh, strictly managed. Some camps, though, that have been in existence for a very long time, um, I'm thinking of the camps in western Tanzania, they look more like a, a town or a, a village than they do a refugee camp. But in all cases, yes, usually it's a combination of government authorities and, and UN officials who uh, manage and um, uh, maintain the, the camps themselves. Okay, great. So, Sherry, um, it's, I guess, year one, end of year one into right. the five-year grant. Right. Give us an update. How are things going? And I think you have a video. Or I do. I can share a video okay. in a, just a second. I will. Um, well, it's going incredibly well in the sense that we have learned so much. I mean, we had a, a discovery phase, if you will, where we could test our own assumptions, figure out what what we needed to do more of. We've done an enormous amount of research. I should mention that, you know, in our partnership, we also have NYU, their Global Ties, um, uh, which does all of their research. So 15 million of that 100 million is actually going to research. We'll be doing five randomized control trials. So that is so critical because there's a dearth of research on what's most effective for children in crisis settings. We will share this with the world, what works, what doesn't work, and it literally will double the amount of research out there for others to use, again, to be make, making sure that we're creating a model that's replicable, because our goal is to transform humanitarian response. I mean, on a, on a um, so sort of on a practical level of the things, we have 
created and completed the advisory seminars. We learned so much from the people in the region about what our curriculum is, what we need to be addressing. We have created an all new, um, we're in the process, production starts this month, Ahlam Simpson, which means welcome sesame in Arabic, even to brand new Muppets. Um, one Jed has had to flee or leave his home. He becomes best friends with Basma. Um, it will be, you know, the sesame you know and love, but in these productions, we create completely local, adapted productions that are indigenous so that children see characters and storylines they can relate to. And I think the most important thing for people to understand is there's three components. There's the research, there's the mass media that you think of when you think of Sesame. It'll be not just television, but mobile and YouTube, and we'll use every means possible. The penetration for media in camps and in all four countries is enormously high. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, it's the direct services. It's the incredible staff that IRC has on the ground where we will be giving them, arming them with incredible Sesame content, training, and you'll see home visitations, learning centers, and I think the best way to get a sense of that is to see a short clip. It's better than anything I could try to describe, and if you look closely, you'll see a, a Muppet in there. You won't recognize her because she's Tantan from the Jordanian production, but it will give you a sense of both the Eco, you know, the, we want to have an ecosystem where they have media, where they have educational content, where we're addressing the social and emotional skills they need, but then you have that direct touch with someone coming into the home to reach those children and families who need it most. And if we could roll this mic, I think they would get a sense of the work. Sabah al khair. Our early childhood program begins in the home. Whether it's a shelter, a tent, a crowded apartment, it doesn't matter. The most important thing is that the children need to be with their parents, the first caregivers with whom they will build trusting relationships and learn new things in order for them to be able to build knowledge on the long run. Ah, okay. We give them activities to promote reading, learning the alphabet, counting, a lot of language skills. We empower the parents with skills to support their child's development. They can play with them using objects that they can find in their homes. We show them how to communicate with their children frequently in a way that promotes praise. Most of the parents that I work with, when we first meet, they describe their role as shelter provider, food provider, as the one who's making sure that their children survive. Yet with time, they start engaging with their children and they would say, I used to do this in Syria, but I was not able to do it anymore with my kids. Thank you for helping me. صارت نعقد نفسي حتى حنا لهلا تحسي على طول روح عرب المدارس هنيك ما عاد نفع نبتين نبعتن على المدرسة ولهلا بس بيشوف ويسمع حس ضرب أو العاب نارية غزايف يعني قالوا هون ما في شيء ماما هون عادي طبيعي ما عنا مو متى بسوريا موعد حفلة عيد ميلاد تونتون نحن بنعرف إنه الأطفال إجوا من بيئة مختلفة بيئة فيها حرب شافوا أشياء ممكن إنه خوفتهم يعني في عندهم حالة إنه غير الأطفال العاديين اللي هني رحين على المدرسة فنحن لحتى نرجعهم ثقتهم بنفسهم بدنا نحاول نحن نعملهم هاي كلهم نعملهم المكان الآمن نعملهم البيئة الآمنة لحتى هني بيشعروا بالثقة والمدرسة مأمنت له هالشيء فهني أكيد راح تأثر بالمستقبل راح يبنوا مجتمع أكيد راح يكون المجتمع مني مجتمع فعال أكيد <تصفيق> 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 
So that gives you a sense of, of what we're doing. And, and it's so important to understand, too, that when children are experiencing toxic stress and the trauma that affects, literally affects their ability to learn, their brain development, the most important thing to help mitigate that effect is more engagement with a caring adult. So much of what we're doing is designed for our content to not only be a tool for the children, but a catalyst for that critical engagement between adult and child. And I have to say, to Celia's point, we never dreamed that in less than one year, another foundation would step up. And the Lego Foundation, um, Sesame Workshop had partnered with them in Africa and in India, so we had worked with them, but they had never, um, they had never invested in humanitarian work before. And because they were inspired by MacArthur, because they knew Sesame, they worked with us, but they also said that the rigor with which MacArthur had put us through gave them the confidence to give us a hundred million dollars again, within, this never happens, within <laughs> uh, one year, so that we could deepen our work in Jordan and Lebanon with learning through play and expand to Bangladesh to the Rohingya um, crisis. And so, you know, it's an enormous um, opportunity and responsibility, but we are so thrilled because it means we are transforming humanitarian response and others are stepping up to invest in those critical early years. And our hope is that with this, we just create more content with, um, in mind that could be as adaptable and replicable and used, whether it's Venezuela, whether it's Sub-Saharan Africa, so this really can be a model to reach displaced children wherever they may be. That's great. Cecilia, actually, I wanted to ask you, too, about how your grant process, this 100 and change scenes to have triggered, uh, you know, sort of an overflow of, uh, or not overflow, well, it's not an overflow, overflow. <laughs> <laughs> not a trigger a series of other types yes. of grants. It, was that kind of by accident or was it by design? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, to, to be honest, it wasn't completely by design. When we started 100 and Change, we were very focused on finding something that we would invest in. But it quickly became apparent that we were uncovering ideas that would be of interest not only to us, but to other donors and philanthropists. And we've received many calls about the projects that were submitted. Uh, we have, as our best estimate, leveraged an additional $245 million for submissions to 100 and change. One of them includes oh, that $100 million <laughs> grant. Um, but inspired by that, we've done a couple of things. First of all, we have a solutions bank with everything we received in the first 100 and change available to the public. So I encourage you to sometime when you want to get inspired, go and look at these amazing ideas from around the world. The second thing is that we are launching a new initiative um, called Lever for Change where we will be helping other donors, particularly those who are small family foundations, maybe individual donors, uh, with using our type of process to identify projects, perhaps in a specific thematic area, or they can be as open as 100 and change. Uh, we are looking at large com commitments, 10 million or higher, over five year period in a similar kind of vein, because what we know is that there are lots of people who wanna do good things. The other thing I'll just have to mention is that we are doing 100 and Change again. It launched this morning. Um, and so I'm really excited to see what gets submitted this time. Well, would you entertain some of the previous proposals as well? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, projects are welcome to resubmit, and I do know we'll be getting some back. I've been in conversation with them. Right, so you can get to the like the boring ones. Like <laughs> None of them were boring. No. <laughs> in fact, if I, if, if I have one regret about the first 100 and change, I thought when you do something wide open like that, you should get some really wacky things and that I would have good stories to tell. There were not very mm -hmm. many wacky things. <laughs> well, actually, I d I'll get to a, you <laughs> later with a question about boring um, <laughs> you know, uh, s suggestions. But Sherry, I want to ask you qu another question about randomized controlled trials. Um, one of my most Im uh, impactful um, uh, pieces of research that I looked at 
we were, uh, it was in our previous book, but it really underscored for me the whole issue of um, early childhood uh, interventions. And it was when the Romanian regime collapsed and uh, there were a lot of orphanages in Romania. I don't know why there were so many orphanages with children in them, unfortunately, but there were a lot. And so they had a chance to do yeah. an experiment. And they took basically, you know, 60 Romanian children. They said, let's place them with foster homes. And they said, let's look at and leave 60 there and let's see what happens. And they discovered that when they uh, removed, you know, they were able to place kids who were like two years or younger and they put them with foster families. They did very well. These children seemed to adapt and they seemed like normal children, no problem. When they took kids um, from the orphanage who had been there after, you know, two years and beyond, and they, you know, placed them with foster homes two years, older than two years, um, those kids didn't really recover. I mean, they actually were not able to adapt. And so the question was, two years, that is the age? So it was really, uh, you know, um, really pretty um, earth shattering to me that if you don't catch those kids between zero uh, and two. But, but this is, well, this is a great um, piece of evidence for what we're doing. I mean, zero to five is the most important time in a child's brain development. And if they don't have that nurturing care and that engagement with a caring adult, particularly if they've been through trauma, then they are, l it literally affects their brain development and they are less able to learn down the road, as Cecilia said. So all the research points to the critical importance. So you imagine, even if it was only two years, those children had two year more years of neglect, of not having the stimulus. You know, in order to grow, your brain needs nutrition, it also needs stimulus. So it's, um, that I think is just another great example of why this is so critical. Like these children can't be left behind and they are at a disadvantage, a long-term disadvantage, not just in terms of academics, but there are studies that show long-term physiological, health, um, economic, if we're not reaching them in those critical early years. Right, well so I wonder when you're doing the randomized controlled trial, when NYU was doing these trials, how will they, I mean, you obviously uh, have to select because you just don't have enough money to reach everybody. So it's those, everybody who, the other people who are left behind who won't get in the trial, therefore won't get the attention. And they're going to be sort of those ones who are like left in the orphanage, right? Well, it'll be those who have exposure to the content and those who don't. Sarah is actually the expert on this. She'd be better to speak to it than anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. And um, so there are a lot of different ways that you can do trials like this. And um, one of the best ways that we've found in, in the context context where we work where you really don't want to have a, a true control group where uh, some children don't receive the service um, is uh, is a staggered approach. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are really two different ways that with these trials that we'll um, get a, a control group of children who we can um, measure our impacts um, compared to the impacts of a child who wouldn't have the program. So you can do it by um, staggering, as I said, in the sense of saying some children will get the program just a year later. And so then we'll be able to randomly assign some children to the program in, in a given year and some children to the program in a year later. And um, the random assignment and testing of them will assure that those children are equal in all other ways except for receiving the program. The other thing that we will do um, and often do in these kinds of contexts is uh, instead of um, creating a complete control group, we just vary our treatment. And by varying the treatment, not only um, you're giving two different groups of, of children, again, equal in most other ways except for these two different kinds of programs they're receiving. And what you do is you evaluate the impacts of these um, of these two different kinds of programs. And what that allows you to do further is say, okay, um, this is the impact that this 
kind of intervention has on a child um, different from this other intervention. Um, both uh, treatments in, in these cases, because as Sherry mentioned, uh, there are so few evaluations done in these kinds of contexts. Um, all of the treatments that we will be giving, all of the, the programs, whether it's a, a preschool curriculum and program or a home visiting program, are based on the best evidence from other contexts. Um, and what we would be doing is changing, for instance, uh, the number of hours a home visitor meets with a parent or the type of group-based parenting session that a parent might attend or the type of curriculum that the teacher will use in her classroom. And just by varying those things, you can still measure the impact of the program without leaving children out. Okay, okay, that's that's really um, comforting. <laughs> I, I'm sure that's what you thought about too when you were designing this. Yeah. Um, so how early do you start? Because I am that you know zero to two was really pretty alarming. Yeah. So uh, well, we start as the the program is from zero to eight years old, um, and we'll be evaluating the um, home visiting portion of the program is primarily for children zero to three, and then the preschools are for children three to six, and then the mass media um, will reach that three to eight year old range. Um, the fact is, though, kids will be watching. There will be kids likely older than eight years old uh, learning from Sesame in the Middle East. And um, But we evaluate the impacts on children themselves, but also on the caregivers, because as Sherry mentioned, uh, these caregivers are really um, the critical ingredient to a child's development. And uh, all the parents in the room know this quite well, but the, the parent, the parents' support to them and um, us being able to evaluate the um, way that parents are caring for their children, the nurturing care that they're providing, then um, has uh, very scientific grounding for then knowing that it will have an impact on an infant, let's say. Um, so something like uh, the... the um, phenomenon of serve and return, which many might have heard of a parent um, uh, giving a greeting to a, a baby even when they're one year old and they can't speak or anything. If you just ignore the baby, they'll start to cry. But if you actually interact with the baby and speak with the baby, then they'll be happy because that's their way of communicating. And if you know that parents are um, doing things like serve and return, speaking with their children, giving them the kind of stimulation that we know will lead to outcomes, then you know that those outcomes will translate for children as well. So you don't have to um, test a, a one-year-old, for instance. <laughs> um, what, uh, I don't know if you know these statistics, but you know how many of these kids who are living in uh, camps or even in these communities, how many of them do not have their parents with them? Mm -hmm. The We don't have, uh, unfortunately, um, great data on the number of uh, children without parents. Most of the kids, though, in from Syria and inside Syria are living with family members. It's a small fraction of kids who are completely orphaned. Um, and we do have programs reunifying children with families and also putting them into foster families. Most of the children, though the vast majority of the children, we are serving with this program. Uh, are living in homes with families, with their parents or other family members. Right. So, Sherry, is this also a way for you to reach, uh, you know, the countries at large? I mean, for instance, Lebanon. Oh, and uh, can you talk a little bit about absolutely. that? Absolutely. I yeah. should have emphasized that if I didn't. I apologize. Um, when I say with their new neighbors, one of the most important things is that we're reaching young children. Yes, they may be Syrian um, refugees, but we're reaching them side by side with young Jordanian children, young Lebanese children, young Iraqi children, because the needs are there for um, early education among all those children. And that's one of the great benefits of having the mass media, is you're not just reaching a refugee child, you're reaching all children through mass media, through our mobile, through um, all of the means we mentioned using telephones, using YouTube. and 
part of the programming, when I mention the characters, is that we will be, you know, we have a very specific curriculum around giving children the emotional ABCs, mm -hmm. giving them the ability to define and identify emotions, which is critical for a child in order to have them be able to um, form the self-regulation and the focus they need to learn. But it also, as Sesame does so well, is modeling inclusion yeah. and respect and understanding. And as I mentioned, um, Jed came from somewhere else and is best friends with Basma. So the storylines will be about acceptance and understanding, which is so important for all of those children to receive so that we're talking about bringing communities together. Um, one of the things that Sesame Street is so good at is also, in some ways, educating the parents. I mean, yes. you know, parents who don't necessarily know that much about, you know, how to, you know, uh, educate their kids when they're very young. I mean, they, you know, they have an instinct maybe that they want to hug and kiss and talk and stuff like that, but they may not. They may sort of let the, the kid cry because there was that old sort of, you know, uh, you know, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. If you just, you know, keep going over and hugging them, then they're just going to keep crying. So, I mean... How is um, uh, you you know how are you trying to educate parents as well, both inside these camps and communities uh, as well? Mm -hmm. Well, and this is w one of the many amazing things about Sesame content is that it does appeal Feels to parents as much as very intentional. It, it yes. does children, and um, we've seen this from the start of our pilot. Um, parents immediately come around the Sesame content and engage with it and learn from it um, alongside their children. Uh, the program itself um, has a, uh, this home visiting component is directly um, targeting parents and caregivers. And so we have home visitors, as Cecilia mentioned, community health workers. These could be protection workers um, and other community educators who go into the home, meet with parents. We have a curriculum that they follow um, and uh, they are essentially teaching parents and um, really mentoring and coaching them using Sesame content um, as, a, as a really excellent tool. And, and one thing I'll add is that um, I don't think a lot of people understand this, but I always thought it was so prescient because Joan Gans Cooney, who created Sesame 50 years ago this year, um, even in 1969, she had a theory that if if the show could appeal to adults as well as children, that the learning would be deeper. Because if an adult were watching with a child, the learning could also go off screen. And so that's why there was Jim Henson and the Muppets and parodies and celebrities and musicians, um, because it was designed to appeal to the adult as well. And I believe in our work in poverty in the United States, where we're working with vulnerable families, in our work um, around the world, so much of our real impact today is because we're able to create content that appeals to the adult as well as the child, again, to promote that engagement between adult and child. So, Cecilia, you've got this big smile on your face because you're so glad that you made this grant, right? <laughs> yes, she is. I hope. I'm very um, proud of this grant. <laughs> <laughs> so, but some of the most effective humanitarian aid is really boring, and I want to get back to this concept of boring, meaning micronutrients. I mean, this is like vitamin, you know? Oh, that's not boring <laughs> at all. <laughs> Deworming pills, okay? Like, take a pill twice a year just to get the worms out of your body. Or, you know, distributing bed nets, all right? You know, so what happens to this kind of uh, philanthropy? Well, I mean, two of the ones were finalists in our, in our competition. I don't think it's boring when you recognize the impact that these interventions have on people and the and part of the work that we've been doing with our applicants is actually helping them understand how to tell the story that brings the human face to these kinds of interventions so that people who are who maybe think bed nets are boring will figure out that they really aren't at all um, the you know the range of projects that we received I, I'll just give you one example of one that that was really enlightening for me. We, we had the submissions had to produce videos. And one of the videos was from a project where the person walked along a street with their cell phone camera on the sidewalk and to point out how treacherous sidewalks can be for people with, in wheelchairs. 
right? Because there's lots of potholes, there's cracks. It's not something, we don't walk around thinking about that. And, and that bit of storytelling really kind of elevated what might sound like a boring project to fix potholes and sidewalks into something that was really going to have an impact on the lives of people and improve, um, make the world more inclusive. And Do you think that foundations need to be more creative in their philanthropy or, you know, or, or, or you think that it's creative enough? Well, I come from a foundation that has had a long history of creativity. The other program that I run there is the MacArthur Fellows Program, which recognizes exceptionally creative individuals. So it is part of our DNA to, to try and be creative and to try and be not so insular in thinking about what it is that we might do, ways in which we might help make the world better. So other foundations, should they be more creative? Well, you know, I'm not. <laughs> I think there's a diversity of approaches in philanthropy that we need to meet the diversity of needs that we have. But is there this need to change, to really push ahead, to actually bring in more philanthropists? Is there something that has to be done? There is definitely, the uh, definitely a need. There is a, a study that just was released not long ago called the Four Pathways Study from um, Bridgepan and Associates that looked at what they have labeled the aspiration gap. Um, there are many wealthy people who have say they want to give away their money um, in, in, some, in some cases before they die, and they're doing it very slowly. And so clearly there is a need to create the infrastructure to help make that money flow to the many humanitarian needs that are out there in the world. So Sarah, uh, one question. Um, not all of us have a spare 100 million to donate. <laughs> So what can the, you know, the typical Milken, you know, uh, attendee here do to help? <laughs> well, I think um, everyone can do, do a lot of things. And I, one of the, the things that I think especially here in being in Los Angeles always reminds me um, that, that Cecilia just mentioned is, uh, you know, I think the the people who are affected by conflict and crisis, especially refugees right now, need their stories told. And they need them told in a way that um, shows how powerful they are, how resilient they are. Um, children in particular uh, need to be showcased. And I think there's there are a lot of things that people here could do to tell those stories and reframe uh, this issue. Um, I think, the, the other thing, and for people, even if they don't have a hundred million dollars, um, a, a few or a couple hundred thousand would do. Um, but really what, what uh, Cecilia has proven and MacArthur pr proved is that one large grant can change the trajectory of giving. And what we are trying to do right now is turn this exceptional grant into the rule. This program right. is the largest humanitarian uh, early childhood program in the world, but it shouldn't be. This should be a standard part of humanitarian response and everyone can call for that. So Sherry, I want to uh, give you the last question before we um, um, invite someone on stage and then also before we go to Q&A. You made a visit to a camp with a furry friend. Can you tell I us about did. that? I, I've, I've visited um, Zatri and Azrak many times, but I will never forget the first time I visited because I had Elmo with me. And I cannot tell you, whether you're here, anywhere around the world, how children respond to Elmo. They just love him. Excuse Elmo, Miss Sherry. Excuse Elmo. Hello, everybody. <laughs> hello, Hi, Elmo. everybody. <laughs> hello, Elmo. Okay, well, hello. <laughs> hello. Boy, everybody looks so nice. I almost should have put a blazer on or something. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi Elmo. Sherry. I'm so glad you're here with us. <laughs> I want you to meet my friend, Miss Cheryl. Hello. And you remember Sarah and Cecilia? Yeah, good to see you. We were Hi, just, Elmo. We Hi. were just telling everybody here about our work in Jordan and how you went with me to visit Oh, yeah. Places. Elmo loved that trip, Miss Sherry. Yeah, Elmo learned so much and made lots of new friends, too. Well, you're very good at making friends. Well, yeah, Elmo, can you tell us a little bit about the friends you made? Oh, well, sure. You know, at, at first, Elmo was a little nervous because Elmo thought that maybe the kids were, would be different from Elmo. But you know what Elmo learned? What's that, Elmo? Well, Elmo learned that in some ways we're all a little bit different. Like, Elmo has red fur, and, and Grover has yep. blue fur, and Miss Sherry had... Miss Sherry, yep. you don't have any fur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we're all the same in 
lots of ways, too. Yeah, and, and Elmo's new friends like all the same things that Elmo does. They like to learn and play, just like Elmo right. and his friends on Sesame Street. That's great, Elmo. Yeah, it is great, but, you know, some things Elmo learned were not so great. You know, Elmo's new friends told him that they had to leave their homes because it wasn't safe for them to stay there anymore. Well, you know they were going through a very tough time, Elmo. Yeah. Mm, a lot of Elmo's new friends don't get to go to school anymore either. Boy, Elmo can't imagine having to leave Sesame Street. And Elmo would never want to stop going to school. Boy, it really made Elmo sad for his new friends. So, so Elmo tried to think of ways to help them feel better. Oh, Elmo, it's great that uh, they met you as a friend. Um, yeah. What did you tell them? Well, Elmo showed them a tip that Elmo learned at home when he's feeling sad. Elmo takes a big belly breath like this. And then Everybody lets it out slowly. <sighs> yeah. That always helps Elmo. And Elmo tried to help his new friends by just being kind to them the way that we're kind to each other on Sesame Street. Well, and I'm sure you did help your friends feel a lot better, Elmo. Uh, thank you, Miss Sherry. Elmo just hopes that his friends get settled into new homes and schools really soon. And we all hope that, too. Yeah. So Th thank you so much for talking to us, thank Elmo. You. We're going we're gonna to talk more about how people can help. Okay. But thank you so much for okay. coming, Elmo. Mwah. Thank you, everybody. Thank <laughs> you. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So we want to take some questions from the audience. Um, if you could stand up and uh, tell us who you are, uh, that would be great. And I think there are mics going around, too. It's a little bit hard for me to see um, any questions, but um, uh, anybody have any questions? Oh, here in the front. Sure. Um, Actually, we have a mic coming to you. My name's Odessa Ray, and I'm a film producer, and I'm actually in the middle of making a documentary on refugee artists, mm, cool. um, which has been massively eye-opening for me, visiting the camps and getting to know these incredibly talented, trying to tell their stories in a very cool, hip, young way that can appeal to the millennial generation that doesn't necessarily pay attention. Um, so I was just edu uh, wondering, when it comes to what your dis how how you create your curriculum, mm -hmm. um, w how do you draw from that? Is it like the standard American oh no no, no. preschool well, you know, stuff or we have a we have a lot of experience because we create <coughs> local adaptations of Sesame around the world, and we we have a model. It's always combining the education, the research, and the creative. But we always go into a country and work with local educators, with local advisors, with local experts, because we want to make sure we're not imposing, um, you know, the American version of the show or our own points of view. I mean, we certainly, you know, we have an incredible team of child development experts, but we work within the region. So, um, for instance, I mentioned the importance of, of giving tools uh, to children to have the language of emotion, um, to be able to identify emotions, because that's so critical for them to be able to heal and overcome traumatic experiences. And one of the things I found so rewarding is, you know, being in Beirut or Jordan and hearing Experts and advisors say this is what's needed. And then just last week I was in Chicago where we're bringing a program we call Sesame Street and Communities into vulnerable communities, much like this, to work with direct service providers to reach children who are experiencing homelessness or incarceration of a parent. And we were being told by those advisors, particularly around the issue of gun violence um, in Chicago and the trauma that that creates for young children, that they needed the emotional ABCs, that the curriculum they needed was to give children the skills to identify the language, the emotions. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can close my eyes and I'm getting the same um, input from, from Lebanon as Chicago. And it really does make you realize that the context may be different, but when children are experiencing trauma, the effect is the same and the needs. Local educators. Yes. We, Yes, it's, it's a whole combination. We'll, um, you know, we often partner with the ministries of education. We bring in local educators. We bring in local writers, artists. Um, but yes, we're always bringing in the expertise within the region so that we really understand the local culture and context and the specific needs of children. Sarah, do you want to add something? Sure. And uh, for instance, Amina, the teacher you saw, 
in the video, she's been an IRC teacher. Um, she's Lebanese, but there are Syrian teachers and Lebanese teachers in, in Lebanon working side by side. And as Sherry described, we bring these educators together to um, adapt what uh, is evidence-based curriculum from other places uh, to that context. And um, the IRC has an approach called Healing Classrooms. We have implemented it in about 25 different countries. And in each country, <coughs> it does look very different. But as Sherry described, it has that base of, of evidence underpinning it. I think we have time for one more question. Does anybody have a question? Nice one there. I know that there aren't very many uh, Syrian refugees let into the U.S. Um, the last couple of years, but are there any programs in existence for those refugees that are here, similar to these? Yes, uh, and happy to talk further about it, but IRC operates in 25 U.S. cities. We're the largest resettlement organization here, and um, though the refugee flows have been changing, unfortunately, in the United States, we offer programs very similar to these uh, to, to refugees and newly arrived asylees and immigrants here in the United States, um, including here in Los Angeles. Uh, we have early childhood programs, education programs, working with uh, typically with U.S. Uh, districts and public school systems, um, educating parents about how to navigate the U.S. education system and how to help their children succeed here in the U.S. So I have one, one question, the last question. So um, is Sesame Street in some of the, I don't know what um, containment centers they are for people coming across the Mexican border? We have. We've, we've partnered with um, Catholic Relief and, and done some work with UNICEF because we can't, we're not a direct service provider, so we can't get in directly. But we have done a lot of work to provide educational content. Everything we do is bilingual, so um, for the migrant children. And, and we had been doing work to um, provide resources to migrant children prior to that, too. But we do it very low-key because they don't you know, often they're nervous about being identified, and so we do it in a way where we're not exploitive, we're not telling you we're doing it. Um, I've taken Muppets to many of the um, shelters here in, well, sorry, we're in LA, in New York, where children were separated from their parents, and so we do. We just don't do it with a lot of fanfare because it's in the best interest of those children to to not call as much attention to it. That's great. Well, let's give a round of applause for these panels. <laughs> of terrific people doing great work. So thank you thank so you much. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for attending. Please make your way to the next session.